morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Dave. This is Dennis. Uh, before Rails Comp, show of hands, who knew what Tuft and Needle was? Anybody? Nice. Okay. <laughs> um, for those that don't know, uh, Tuft and Needle is uh, a mattress company. Um, we have uh, a presence here in Phoenix at Rails Comp this year because our office is here. Um, and uh, Tuft and Needle um, has some interesting elements about it, and one of it is our culture of learning, and that's kind of what we wanted to talk to you about today. Um, so what does it mean to cultivate learning, and why is it important? It's sort of easy to say that growth and learning are important tenants, but, but like, what does that actually mean? How do you actually carry that out in your business? And how do you take that to your team uh, as an investment in them and their sort of collective and individual brain trusts? Um, and, and why do it, right? So like, when we were thinking about this and thinking about the kind of culture we wanted to create at our own business, uh, three things sort of came to mind. It gives people purpose, it allows them autonomy, and it provides them with growth. And all of that kind of leads back to happiness, right? And happiness is kind of hard to quantify, uh, but we sort of think of it in ways like this. If you're working on a problem, and you get stuck, that's a bad feeling, right? And you want to feel like you have a place to go to get unstuck. Um, we feel like underscoring this culture of learning helps people to realize that it's okay to ask for help. You know, as a software developer, as a designer, you can't know everything, right? And that's okay. If you're here, if you're working with us, we already have confidence in you. Like, we, we've already assessed that you uh, have the skills that you need to, to work with us. So from there, it's really about empowering you to know more and to share more with the people that you work with. So, as I said, we're Dave and Dennis. We're from Tuft and Needle. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, this is my newest daughter, Rory. She's nine months. Uh, I have four kids. Y'all pray for me. Um, <laughs> I've been actually working with Rails for around 10 years. I, I found it uh, sort of right at the beginning. Um, and my story with Rails and as a programmer, as I thought about it, is kind of um, relevant to this, actually very relevant to this talk. Um, I was on my own for a long time. Um, I had done some, some work with the military, and then uh, I was kind of, uh, I was basically doing a freelance consulting, um, and I wasn't really looking for a job. And I stumbled upon some guys uh, at this company called Hash Rocket at a coffee shop that I would go to to work. Um, and I think at the time, I, like, I felt like I was doing okay, but I didn't really know that I, I didn't know that I needed something more, right? Like I, I, was, I was a Python developer, I was doing some Ruby stuff, things were fine. Um, and I had this chance encounter, and they invite me down to the office um, through a, a sort of other weird situation um, that involved guitar lessons of all things. Uh, but anyway. Um, <laughs> And to be honest, I don't think I was really qualified to work there at the time. You know, I had some Rails experience, uh, and I knew Ruby and all of that, but I think that Hashrocket was sort of the first place where I encountered this culture, and it was, it was, uh, they took a chance on me, right? Like, they saw something in me that they thought that they could cultivate, and they took a chance on me and did that. Um, so... You know, 10 years later, I'm still working with, uh, with Rails full-time, tough to needle, and, uh, and leading the team there now. Cool. 
Um, so like Dave said, my name is Dennis. Um, I know that picture is incredibly Asian, but like, uh, <laughs> well, like uh, I have a relatively similar uh, kind of experience as Dave. Um, I actually met Dave at Hash Rocket. Um, as a designer, it's a little weird that I um, more relate to people in the technology field than the traditional like, like band posters and CDs and all that type of design, but it's, it's always been an interesting culture to kind of be a part of. Um, I've been designing for a little over 16 years. I kind of started off like a lot of people, like self-taught. And one of the reasons that um, like creating culture learning and like trying to you know, make that a core part of our culture is important to me is that um, a lot of you, um, like for a lot of us, uh, the pathway to where we are right now is not very straight or clear, right? There's probably a lot of you that had a history degree or something or an English degree or something completely off you taught yourself or you went to school for something completely different. But um, without those straight and clear paths, it, it's much more important to have people along the way that will kind of either guide you, give you a break, and just kind of take you under the wing, whether it's for one project, for a day, or years. Um, those people are pretty crucial and they've helped me get to the point where I am in my career. And so part of, the, part of why I like doing this is kind of giving back and giving um, other people opportunities to, to grow and hopefully you know, surpass and go much farther than, than me. Um, so I'm gonna, one of, the, one of the ways that we kind of um, handle like uh, growth at our, at our company is we use um, like two different methods which are mastery programs and then apprenticeships. So I'll let Dave kind of talk a little bit about the apprenticeships. Yeah, so apprenticeships, um, I mean I don't think that word is hopefully something that's new to uh, a lot of people in our community. Um, you know, it's, some, it's something that we pull obviously from other, other industries. Um, but I think what's important for us is that it sort of starts with the language, right? Um, so across the board, whether you are a software developer or you work in our customer service area or you know, at the retail store or whatever, um, we use this language. So it's not, you know, you're a junior developer, you're a senior developer, like we don't put people in those buckets. It's, you know, uh, you know you're apprentice, you're a journeyman, uh, you're a master, that kind of stuff. Side note, um, and this is a personal pet peeve, I don't think you can call yourself a master. I think that's kind of something that somebody says about you. And I know like for me that's, you know, uh, it, it's, it speaks to like, you know, the life lived instead of the life attained. Um, and, that, and that helps me think about like, you know, continuous growth and learning and how to prioritize myself instead of like thinking about how I get to the next level and, you know, how I get to the next, uh, compensation bracket and that kind of stuff, you know. It helps me focus on learning and growth and personal growth and that affects my happiness, right? Um, because if I'm not worried about getting to that next ladder and, the, you know, that next step on the ladder, you know, it's, it's just one less thing to worry about, right? So finding talent is hard. Uh, I read a statistic recently that last year there were over 223,000 vacant jobs in our industry. Um, and there are not enough people coming out of computer science uh, programs to fill those spaces, right? So hiring is always a problem. I mean, you see it here at RailsConf every year. That's why like people are, you know, uh, sponsoring and you know trying to get your attention and trying to get you to come work with them. Um, but I think there's other ways, and one of them is to be on the lookout for people that are right in front of you, right? People that you're already in your organization, they already have the values that, that you have. Maybe they don't have that exact skill set, but I think if you pay attention and you listen, you'll find people that you can cultivate and bring into other departments, right? Bring into software development, bring into design. So, um, Like I said, you know, this is this is something that um, I don't know if I don't know how widespread it is, but it's something like we really care about. Um, 
you know, I think uh, going back to previous jobs that I've been in, I wish there were people that were sort of paying attention to that. Like, I'm just starting out, you know, maybe I'm just doing this, this thing over here. And, you know, if, if there was somebody there that like could just see that, you know, it could be a spark for somebody, right? Um, so guidelines, how do we actually do it? How do we, how do we approach our apprenticeship programs? Um, so this is something that's like constantly changing and something we're thinking about and working on every time and, and iterating on because that's, you know, kind of what we do as software developers and it's also what we do at Tough Needle with our products. Um, we meet quarterly usually <laughs> uh, and talk about um, their strengths and weaknesses. Um, we set milestones. We think that goals are really important, especially at the beginning, uh, to get people on the right track. Um, we set the right expectations from the beginning, um, which I think uh, you really need to consider um, because if you set unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, it can really throw the whole thing off. People can get nervous and they want to quit and you know there's all that stuff. Um, and then uh, we actually compensate people based on this. So when they meet their goals and they meet their milestones, we pay them more, right? Um, and we think that that makes sense because you know the more you learn, the more value you know you can add, and uh, we want to recognize that. So this is Tommy. We have. Um, we have a large customer experience group uh, at Tuft & Needle. Um, we have something, something around 150 employees. Mm -hmm. um, we have about 10 developers, um, you know, some designers, and then a lot, a lot of the people are, are in this group, customer experience, right? And that's what Tommy was. Tommy um, has, a, has a cool background. Uh, he was uh, a school teacher before he came to Tuft & Needle. Uh, middle school, which I imagine is like crazy stressful and hard. <laughs> yeah. He's shaking his head no right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he he was kind of interested in technology, um, and he, you know he he did, after a couple of years of being a teacher, he decided that it just wasn't for him. He needed to do something else, um, and so he was kind of exploring HTML and things like that, um, and then he got a job. Uh, at Tuft & Needle in the customer, customer experience department, you know, when he was hanging out um, in retail stores and helping customers and, you know, helping people, uh, um, you know, through email and all that kind of stuff that they do. Um, and he was working on this, you know, this stuff, um, for learning, you know, launch school stuff, that kind of thing, on his own. And he, you know, kind of just started asking us questions. Um, and he came to RailsConf with us last year. and it, and at some point, it was like, okay, like, this is this is happening. Like, we need we need to take this guy under our wing. We need to develop him. Like, he's obviously got the aptitude for it. Super smart. Already knows the business. Let's you know, let's let's make him part of the development team. So um, that's that's what we did. We actually have. Um, one of the guys that writes a course for Launch School, the JavaScript course, his name is Shane Riley, and he works at Tuft & Needle. And uh, we are super lucky to have him. I think he's like top tier front end developer, crazy good. Um, but, you know, Tommy had access to, to, to Shane, and we have his material to use. So I think that's, um, uh, it's awesome for Tommy, obviously it's awesome for us, but like, um, I think, you know, those kinds of formal uh, learning experiences are good, and, and you should encourage your employees to and your coworkers to use them and pay for them, um, and and you know take care of that so that people can have that that training. Um, like I said, this is sort of a constant thing that we are trying to iterate on, and we're making mistakes and failures with. Um, some of the lessons that we're learning uh, are, you know. It's really important to get people in apprenticeships on to real world projects as soon as possible. We think it, you know, it helps build confidence. 
Um, it gives them ways to apply what they're learning in real ways. Uh, you know, we've all taken those tutorials and, you know, you get to the end, it's like you've made this thing, but how do you actually translate that into something real in the world? Um, it stretches them and uh, it creates the structure and, you know, and uh, helps them transition. Um, so yeah, Tommy is part of uh, the front end team and he's like a full-fledged member now, it's awesome. Um, and he built, uh, he built a project, he released it just uh, like last week, is that right? First like big project, it's awesome. Um, and he did a great job and I, I know he feels like super accomplished. Cool, so um, I'm gonna talk from the design side of things and uh, Rachel actually came from a very similar experience too. She was um, part of our customer experience team um, she was, she actually didn't have any formal training in design. She knew of like the programs and could kind of do stuff, but like she didn't go to school for, you know, for graphic design or any, anything kind of like similar to that. I think it was design history was her degree. So um, like one of the big things that we kind of learned with her is that uh, like a, a lot of students who are self-taught, um, tend to do like tutorials or do things where it's like, you know, you use this one, you learn one technique, and that technique allows you to do one thing, right? And then that's all you really kind of know. And then, you know, you don't really understand a lot of the fundamentals where it's like typography or grid or pacing or rhythm or all that stuff is kind of like left alone. And hopefully you get it on your own or, or you know, maybe you don't. Um, it's kind of like akin to, uh, I don't know if it's a perfect metaphor. It's like if someone just knew how to use Rails alone but couldn't write any Ruby from scratch at all. So that's basically the kind of situation that she was in. Um, she, didn't, she had a couple teachers that were helping her out, um, but not on a consi like consistent level, and a lot of them were like high level, like, hey, get this flyer done, versus like, hey, I'm gonna help you like, learn how to lay out a grid and how that's like, helpful for future projects. So a lot of the, um, and we didn't get it, um, just like with like, you know, Tommy, I don't think we really got it perfect the first get-go, I think we tried to kind of like load her with a bunch of work and tried to um, just kind of have this pretty brutal routine where we like set up a curriculum and every week she would basically meet with me and go over stuff. But um, I think um, it's, it's kind of a sign of a poor teacher if you blame your student for like their, like for them not really getting to where they need to go. So kind of took a second to reassess the situation, pared down the curriculum to a point where it was more concentrating on fundamentals and like the basics of visual design before like, so she was trying to learn like front end coding and design and then stuff about web and so it was just like too many things at once. So I think one of the biggest lessons learned is just kind of setting realistic and clear goals so that um, you're not just throwing someone in water and hoping that they kind of like make it work. Um, and then setting expectations and timelines is also a big deal too, like for her, um, I think there was a lot of looseness around, you know, you're working on this project, but never saying, hey, this is, you know, you need to finish this by like two weeks from now. Like, whether it's done or not, like come to a point where um, you kind of get there. Because projects before that were given to her were often like just open timelines, like they weren't very important, so they would last for like four to five months or something, and like there would be no clear endpoint. And the thing about design, and I'm sure it's the same thing with development, is that, um, you can pretty much tinker on anything forever until someone gives you like a stopping point. So it's really important to kind of get that idea um, to younger designers to make sure that they understand that you need to, you know, done is better than perfect, if you will. Um, so the next slide kind of shows like the progress that she kind of made. Um, uh, to designers, this was a big deal because um, typography is like a very big tell of like how mature you are as a designer. And from where she started to now, although albeit these be very simple pieces, her ability to lay out stuff and like do it on her own without much guidance is dramatically improved. And like uh, she's become a very, you know, a very uh, important member of a design team to kind of help us um, accomplish all the things that we need to do. So, um, like I said, there's two parts to kind of what we do at Tough Needle for the culture of learning, and um, the second part is mastery programs. I'll let 
kind of Dave go from here? So back to happiness, you know, continuous growth. Um, we think it's key to increasing happiness. Um, and, you know, it, it works for everybody. It works for the person that's learning. It works for the person that's teaching. Um, you know, if you've ever tried to teach anything, uh, you realize quickly that it, you don't know anything. <laughs> um, and it, it's just a really great way to sort of solidify your, your thoughts and knowledge about a subject. Um, so we have this thing called mastery programs uh, at Tuft & Needle, and it's, uh, again, it's across the board. It's not just in software development and design. Um, we, we use it in every aspect of the business. Um, and basically how it works is uh, it's a little different from team to team, um, but there's sort of uh, some guidelines um, across the board. Um, you know, again, we meet with everybody every quarter and we sort of try to figure out what their individual um, learning path looks like. Um, but we also try to do things uh, as a group. So um, we've tried a few different things, but sort of what we're doing right now is um, carving out a specific day and time during the week uh, that we can, you know, structure as learning time. Um, and I think this is really important. You have to be intentional about it. If it's always ad hoc and just kind of whenever and loosey-goosey, you're never going to get to it. Um, so we block out that part of the calendar every single week, um, and we use it, uh, you know, to, to learn and to grow. Um, design team does it on Wednesdays. We do it Thursdays, usually around lunch. Um, but we're, we kind of talk every week about whether or not that's still working. You know, we're open to change it if, if we need to. Um, mob programming. Anybody done this? Anybody? The mob mind. This is really fun for us. Um, I, love, I mean, I love it personally. Um, so what we do is we're, we're mostly remote team, so we get together, uh, you know, on uh, a hangout, and uh, we use... We've done a couple of things. We, we mostly uh, use Vim, mostly. Um, <laughs> so uh, we try to get on Teammate or something like that, um, pull up a terminal, and uh, we work on a problem together. Um, and we all participate. And we, you know, even if, uh, we try to make it kind of interdisciplinary um, so that, like, you know, folks that are writing JavaScript all day can uh, spend time with folks that are, you know, writing Ruby all day. Um, you know, we can work on problems together. And this, it leads to some really interesting things. Like, I think when you're, when you're working individually, you don't, you know, you don't see all the perspectives of the team. And I think when you get together and work on something, it really enriches yourself and it enriches the team because you're passing little tidbits. I mean, even little things like, what was that Vim command you just pressed? How did you do that? You know, I mean, it's, that can be really a really valuable time saver for somebody. Um, Another thing we do uh, is book club. Um, I think, you know, this is something that I've done at other jobs. Um, I like it. I always want to read, but kind of never make time to do it at home because I have four kids. Um, but at work, you know, we set aside time to get together and talk about uh, a book um, that we choose. And, uh, you know, it, it helps us to sharpen our technical skills. Um, sometimes we get kind of tired of that and we do a soft skill, um, kind of a book, just to break it up. Um, but yeah, it's fun. So um, similar to those things, the design team does stuff that's kind of like a parallel to that. Um, one of the things that we do is uh, uh, do critiques. Um, so that's kind of borrowed a little bit from design school where, uh, I don't know how familiar some of you guys are from it. Like, so there was usually like 20, 20 students in the class and then you'd basically work all night and day on a project for about two weeks, and then you present it in front of all these people, and then they basically criticize you for about 20 minutes. And it's That's about fun. as painful and terrifying as, as you'd imagine. Uh, a lot of people were assholes in college, so <laughs> it, uh, but we try to do something similar without the other aspect of just like people's egos kind of getting away. And a lot of it is, is geared towards um, some kind of comment or feedback that drives your design one step further, right? 
So constructive comments, something like, have you tried this? This isn't as clear as I think you're making out to be, or like, are you achieving like the goal that you're trying to do with this layout or this interaction? All those things um, hopefully give them ideas on where to go from there, because the worst thing that could happen for a designer and for anybody really is to be like, I don't know what to do next. I, I'm stuck. It feels like it's wrong. I don't know how to fix it. So having the entire team kind of share that, share that experience, present their own work, help other people, um, not only makes our designs better, but it also makes um, us better designers because we're sharing knowledge. So like the technique that I suggested someone go check out to, to help with this particular you know, site might help someone on another site in the future. So all those things are really, really important for shared learning because like you don't, like the group needs to get better as a, as a, as a group or you're just gonna have a lot of issues where only one person can do the task versus like everybody can kind of jump in and chip in wherever is needed. Um, one other kind of program that is kind of related to the, like some of the things we spoke to before is the quarterly skill plans. Um, we actually treat these like first class citizens like projects. So um, there is a very easy tendency to be like, all right, you know, someone write in a notebook and then like, good luck, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later. But what we try and do is basically like track these things and um, uh, we use a program called Asana. Uh, some people love it, some people hate it. But uh, it's, uh, we basically put milestones, we say deadlines of when you're gonna basically accomplish these specific goals. And then the biggest thing is um, setting realistic goals. So like an example of a bad goal would be like, I wanna get better at JavaScript. Like, cool, everybody does, like that's great. <laughs> like, but like saying like, I wanna write, write an API node or something. Like, so that's much more tangible um, and it's much more attainable and it's much more realistic to say that versus like I'm going to master an entire aspect of something. So um, those, treating those like, like and having them like show up alongside like get this project out with I need to learn this this week has been like really um, important to make sure that it's baked into everybody's everyday life. Um, it, and it's made a huge difference, I think, for me compared to other environments where we try to do the same thing but didn't have that level of, um, uh, uh, that level of like um, checks and balances, if you will. So again, the um, one thing we want to talk about, like another way to really kind of make this much more, um, much more ingrained in the culture and, and, and uh, not like it's just like one group that's kind of like doing it is all of our skills are, are, are tied to compensation structure. So like if you put together a skill plan in a quarter and then you reach that plan, we basically will give you um, a raise based on how many of those things you've accomplished. Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, so um, I'll use one of mine for example. like. Uh, well, actually, no, let me use uh, another one. One uh, was a designer who was like, I really want to get better at like, writing, right? Like, because like, um, I don't know how many designers you know, but like, writing is design, is user interface. Like, that is a very core skill that you need. Um, so they set out a project where like, all right, I'm gonna write, um, I'm gonna write specific like ads or like copy for a page, and then like, I'm gonna do these specific, like, uh, like a project where I help generate like the layout, which in the like the labels and elements and stuff like that. So we would go through and then say it, and then like they would basically put a deadline, like all right, this project will be completed by the first month, maybe two weeks after that, and whatever. And then by the time I meet with them again, I'll be like, all right, how did it go? How much of this stuff worked? And then we'd be like, all right, you know, since you did this, uh, you accomplished your goal, you'll get like a two percent raise this quarter. And then the good news about the way that we do the structure of the, the raises is that um, we don't wait till the end of the year to give you like, like a raise because you're, you're already like contributing more because you've learned that skill. So, so the exercise was on the spot. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's more of like a to-do list, not necessarily like how many hours we're not like doing it to that level, but just like kind of judging the success of the project and what they learned. Yes. 
Yeah, for that skill or for that person. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's an interesting point too. Like at first we did things where people were like, I'm gonna learn four skills this quarter and like it just was not tenable. Like we, we really focused it down to like, hey, you need to concentrate on just like one thing. Ten of both. <laughs> like, yeah, both. Uh, most of the time people would only hit one or two. Like and then like management wise, it's hard to like, if you have, our team has started to grow and you're trying to manage like that many aspects of people's growth, it's, it's kind of tough, so. Uh, I mean, there has to be somewhat of a business case. It can't be like I really like you know, bedazzling stuff. Like that's not like <laughs> that's not like very useful to the business probably. But like, like so for instance, I mean, a more practical one. Like I really like I was into like learning more about VR stuff, and I want to do more stuff. But like we couldn't really justify that. Like hey, like let me go buy this two thousand dollar rig and get better at this to the company because of what our goals are, but you know, like I focused on, in my personal case was like learning more JavaScript, which is much more fair. But copywriting is a little bit more tangential design too, and some of the guys have gotten better at like, like woodworking, which is good for some of our product design members and other stuff. So there is a certain level of judgment of like, it's not just whatever you wanna learn, but it is kind of targeted towards your job. Oh, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I, we don't think it has to be like the deliverable could be a, a made-up project that. Hmm. I, I think it depends. Yeah. I think it depends on on the goal. Yeah. Um, I, I think also too. You know, we're talking a lot about software and design, um, but the other parts of our business do this. So, like a, a real-world example from one of those is. Uh, if you work in customer experience and you want to understand more about the operation side of the business, um, so we have you know different shipping situations, dark store, FedEx, you know all this other stuff. Um, we might set a, that that uh, leader might set a goal for that person to learn about those things and then deliver them you know some write up about what they learned, you know that kind of thing. So for instance, like some of our customer experienced people would learn how to use SQL or write SQL to write queries to use to track things so they could build like their own dashboards to, to um, kind of monitor some aspects of, of their particular daily life. So um, it, it definitely, to your point, it, it doesn't always like be that direct and like it's a real life project that like the business needs. But sometimes like imaginary, not imaginary ones, but like ones that are just like a little bit more fun, stretch the person a little bit more. So it's, it's kind of like, a, like a, a value call on both the person and like one of us to kind of like say, hey, like which one do you think is gonna grow you more or like basically get you farther along that path? So I'll just wrap it up. Yeah, um, that's a good transition. I mean, you know, that's, that's it. That's the whole thing. Like, you know, we think it's an important investment. Um, we think it's great for the business, it's great for the people. Um, and that's it, yeah. Yeah, and I think, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> the last bit is like one of the, like uh, one of our founders is a developer and that's where a lot of this stuff kind of like comes from. Like it was imbued in the culture from the beginning. And it was very important for him to try and create an environment where um, oftentimes a lot of us shift from job to job, right? We go every year, it's a new job or something. That's the only way you can kind of grow and we're kind of used to it, but I think his vision and a lot of us and why we we're attracted to this company is that if you can provide an environment where people are constantly growing and you know, obviously hit all the other marks of like, you know, their needs, whether it's compensation and other stuff, but um, that hopefully they stay there for a long time, 10 years, 15 years. I mean, the idea is like you would be here for a lifetime, that you, we would be able to provide you with the opportunities and maybe that's slightly naive or like slightly um, op, like optimistic, but we would prefer to move with that intention and that vision versus like the pessimistic version where we just basically don't invest in our people and it all, basically we figure they're gonna leave whenever and just kind of like make it sort of a, not, you know, just a, like a bad place to work. Yeah, I mean, I think if you think about it, uh, job hopping is, 
one of the one of the symptoms of it, one of the reasons why you do it is because you're bored. You know, if we can create a uh, if we can create an environment where people don't really get bored, they always feel challenged, then you know we have a better chance of them wanting to stick around. I know that's true for me. Sorry, uh, we can open up to questions too. Um, Thanks thank for you, coming. everybody. Um,